my journey to being a maker was slightly convoluted. Um, I found myself in my 30s realising that most of my friends were filmmakers, photographers, set makers, prop makers, and realising that although I had studied science at university in the first, when I first left school, that perhaps I was a maker, creative person and hadn't really realised. So that sort of set me off on a journey of some evening classes and part-time classes and I wound up uh, doing a part-time foundation course at Camberwell and then on a degree course at Brighton uh, based on making with wood, metal, ceramics and plastics. And I discovered that um, of those four materials it, it, during the course you specialise in two and that part of the choice of where to specialise often relates to the smell of the workshop. So the wood workshop and the metal workshop felt familiar and um, so I continue to make with those materials um, and I attribute quite a lot of my sort of natural making instinct to having grown up on a farm and being used to that kind of self-sufficiency of if something is needed or broken that it's or it's repaired there and then. Um, I also had my great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather were blacksmiths so some of the gates that still exist around the farm would have been made by them and there are some old tools and, and ploughs and things around that would they would have made. Um, and also that I had the kind of primary school education where we were taught to knit and sew and embroidery and all of that automatically, which I suppose doesn't happen. So I've always liked making things and it's relatively recent. So for me, it's in the last 10 years that I now officially make things, if that makes sense. And craft is often considered an immersive activity. How does this apply to your own practice? And what is the balance and approach between cognitive thinking and haptic or fine motor skills? Well, I, um, I find that the reality of my life as a maker involves hopping about between um, lots of different urgencies at different times and that magical space of getting lost in making remains quite elusive um, in, in my life um, but that that comfort with the material of knowing or, or doing I don't because I work across the different materials and I tend to change what I'm doing and I don't have um, things that I repeat very much so I'm often at the edge of, of learning things or trying things and I work quite intuitively so I tend to not be in a very familiar zone a lot of the time um, if that makes sense was there another part to that question that I'm uh, missing well, it's just a case of how you've, you've touched on about your former education and yep. training mm. um, and you, the fact that your work is intuitive and experimental, yes. but is there a reactive element, you know, an immediate response to material and process during a physical act of making? Yeah, well, I tend to, yeah, to be responding always to materials. So um, behind us here, there's a pile of... of of raw material um, so I like to start with wood in its natural form and to adjust it from there um, I find milled timber has a it, it, it's dead to me it doesn't make sense to me um, I don't know what to do with it um, so I I tend and with the work that I'm doing I tend to start with the form that's already in the wood and the way it grew and to work from that so I tend to be responding to that and sometimes I'll be slicing it or carving it or steam bending it or um, planing it or whatever I'm doing but I'm still conscious of the way it grew and that's important I hadn't quite realized how important but yes <laughs> and to what extent is prior education both specialist and state-led contributed to the, the understanding and ongoing development of your practice? Um, 
I would say entirely. So my practice wouldn't exist other than the, you know, if it hadn't been that I'd chosen to go back into education and do that degree at Brighton. Um, I have added some training since, but not very much. Um, I'm about to add some, some more, but um, the, the training that we had there covered sort of um, concept development and practical physical skills um, in parallel in a way that was really useful. Uh, useful is not a great word, but I just love the, the, marrying those two. Um, and we had some quite structured rotations around how to work with materials. And we did spend a great deal of time sanding and finishing things. Sometimes it felt like we were doing a degree in sanding. Um, and I still find when I'm, I'm finishing wood that I go back and my, my head travels back to the workshops in Brighton. So that's where I still am. Um, but um, those material qualities and the challenges of are you going to leave it like that or is it going to be finished um, were really important. And there are at least two of my tutors at Brighton whose voices are still here and who will sort of, are very useful to, to um, sort of interrogate when something's finished. Does it need something else or is that enough now? Um, so those, that, yeah, that degree training was, was the entire foundation of what I do. And following on from this question, how does your practice continue to evolve? And are there any additional factors or inherited knowledge they contribute to this you you touched on earlier about um, a family of, of blacksmiths and obviously working mm. on a farm but are there other transferable skills which you uh, apply to your practice um i think i'm i've since so since i qualified from art school i moved back to northern ireland where i grew up so i now live next to the family farm and i'm therefore more aware more conscious of that um resourcefulness that exists in, in being able to fix things and make things. Um, I recently came across a definition of farming is, is fixing things. Um, but um, can you repeat the question? I've just realised I've talked myself out of it. Yeah, it's, it's how, how does your practice uh, continue to evolve? Mm. And are there additional factors or inherited knowledge that contribute to this? Um, I think what what's, what's the way in which my practice is evolving since I moved back to Northern Ireland is in the connection with the landscape and that that landscape is a place where my ancestors have been for five generations, I think, um, and responding to that. So, so it's more really in content or concept. Um, I'm adding some new training this year. I'm going to do some welding training. Um, and I think, yeah, so I, I, I'm i not sure, other than that kind of resourcefulness, which I realise having lived in London for 20 odd years, I had slightly forgotten. Um, and that part of the, the founding of my practice was that shift between producing and consuming and that in a way my practice is all about shifting away from being a consumer and being a producer of something tangible um, other than something that resulted from a button being clicked. So those agricultural processes which are considered resourceful and fixing, mm. you you embrace those but you, you use them towards creative outputs. Yes, yeah, and there's a way of sort of twist... Not, or sort of adding on, and that there's I'm there's a language in how things are built or made or um, used that is filtering in. Um, so, for example, things like I, um, the first couple of years I was back here, I worked on the farm every day, and that physical knowledge of opening and closing the same gate every day, where you learn 
just the right amount of how much you lean in and push it and where it will swing to and when it comes back and oh it's different on a windy day or it's you know and those um that's a love there's a rhythm in that and of of looking after livestock that has a very particular requirement um that's non-negotiable that they require your attention whether you want to or not um that uh, at this stage my practice hasn't quite got to that level yet but maybe if I were to think of it as a living being that required my attention that might actually be quite useful <laughs> yeah and, and finally how how do you see the future of craft mm. both in its present guise and in response to global political social economic and environmental changes uh, there's a question. <laughs> it is a big question. Um, I think there's um, there's a level of of material engagement and and uh, material intelligence or whatever we want to call it that um, people have forgotten. So I think in 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 certainly in urban life, there's a way in which people. You know, things come in packets all the time. But we have lots of environmental conversations about packaging and this and that and the other. But people are still disassociated, and there's a lot of ways in which, whether it's our food or the material, the, the things that we wear or use, we delegated the production of that to to unseen other people. Um, and then recently, we we collectively are developing concerns about how those things are done but at the same time most people don't want to do those things for themselves or don't want to understand the amount of work that it takes to do those things um, and I think that there's a there's a level of interest in things that are handmade or small batch produced that also comes with you know, it's individually ordered and delivered to your door in a van, which can't doesn't it, it sort of counteracts this environmental concern. People don't know how to make things. I mean, I find it because because I, I've always known how to use a sewing machine, for example. So I become the person that gets asked, "Can you fix that?" or "Can you mend something?" And that, I think there was a period where people didn't even consider mending anything, and that, currently we do. But I'm, I'm slightly concerned that there's a level of it being a slightly fashionable set of concerns at the moment that aren't really real. Um, and that there's a natural sense of frugality that comes from a scarcity of resources that of course means you mend things and fix things and take care of things. Um, and I think that's the kind of mindset that I grew up with on the farm. Um, and that in lots of ways we don't naturally have that and that people are trying to find their way back into it and that sometimes in that there are um, blind spots where it seems I catch myself looking at you know lovely environmental personal you know skincare products or something online and think but if I have to order that and it has to be delivered to me in a special little packet to my door have I not just undone the, the environmental benefit, you know? Um, so I think, I, 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 you know, there's, there's, a, there's a growing, in, there's, there's huge interest in the handmade, which is wonderful. And I think it's important that we know how things are made, but I don't know how practical it is for the, in the wider world or how much political will there would ever be for that to be a realistic way forward.